Good morning again. Uh, before we jump into God's word, uh, would you pray with me? Father, as we just read in Acts 1, 6 through 11, that there's a movement that, that, is, that, that has started here some 2,000 years ago that has impacted us. Because of this movement of your spirit with your people, we are here today gathering, assembling, um, to, to sing songs to you, to offer up prayers to you, and to hear the word of God preached. Father, I pray that you would have your way with us this morning, and we pray for our children who are also um, sharing and hearing the word of God and doing activities. Uh, we pray, God, that you would be with them as well. And our brothers and sisters in other churches in Coopersville and all around the area, we pray that your gatherings would be blessed. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray all these things. Amen. I love the church. I, I, I do. I, I love the church. I, I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you hear the word church, um, but I bet it's far different than what came to the mind of the first church people, right? They, they weren't thinking about choirs or praise bands when they heard the word. Uh, they weren't thinking about staff and programming when they heard the word church. They weren't thinking about pastors who could keep the attention of a congregation when they heard about the word church. Something very different. And, and it's not that any of those things are wrong. God uses those things. He uses choirs and praise bands and staff and programming and even lanky pastors who sometimes can keep the attention of congregations. Like he uses people like us and programs and such. But that's not what was going through the mind of the first church some 2,000 years years ago, it's clear throughout reading the New Testament that the church in its infant stages was really centered around one eye-opening, life-shattering, life-changing truth and historical event. And that was and is the resurrection. This is what the church really centered around, the resurrection. I mean, can, can you imagine with me for a moment being Peter? Friday night, your friend, your savior, is just crucified, buried, and he's thinking to himself, he called it. I, I freaking blew it. I betrayed him three times, and he told me I would, and I still did it. Imagine being Peter or, or John often known as the, the disciple of Jesus, Lala, one of the best friends of Jesus in his earthly ministry. John, thinking to, my, thinking to himself, my friend is gone, murdered. I've left the fishing business. I left my father's business. I don't know what's next. And he's near Jesus' mother as he was called to comfort her by Jesus himself while he was on the cross. And then James, John's brother, who was literally just some 12 or so hours prior to the crucifixion with Jesus, maybe a day before in the garden, and asked to do one simple task, just pray with me. And he, as well as Peter and John, couldn't and they fell asleep and he's thinking that's the last moment, the last request that I had with my savior, my friend, and I couldn't even come through. But the resurrection changes everything, doesn't it? This isn't gonna be an Easter sermon, but I'll take you somewhere with it, I promise. The word of God tells us that without the resurrection, Christians, people like you and me, and maybe you're not a Christian here this morning and we're grateful you're here, but believers of all people are most to be pitied if this thing didn't happen. If this one singular event didn't take place, we are of all people most to be pitied if this didn't happen. And after the resurrection and the ascension, 
we believe to be historical fact and truth. After the resurrection and ascension, what comes next is what we'll talk a lot about today, which is the movement, or a movement in particular. A movement happens, the church is to be a movement. So whatever comes to your mind when you hear the term church, that's great. If it's not connected to a movement, I would challenge you, we need to do some redefining, okay? The movement is centered around a message, the message of hope. And the message calls us to move but the temptation for the church over the generations has been to cease being a movement and instead be more of a destination, a place where people gather, a place where people come, sit, sing, stand, move, listen, shake hands. That's what the temptation has been over the generations when it comes to church. Are we simply performing ministries, my question is, that are attracting people, or are we part of a movement, church? You personally, do you see this church as simply a place that you attend? A place that you attend maybe on Sundays and Perhaps your children attend on Wednesday nights, maybe Sunday nights, your children attend there, maybe you have some connection. You just see it as a place where you attend, or do you see this church and your connection with it as a movement in this city and beyond? What, what, what do you see? How do you connect to it? Do you see yourself as an integral part of this movement, or do you see yourself just as a member who fills a spot? Let me give you some history on what kind of helps to explain some of this struggle that we have between the church being a movement and then the church simply being a destination where people just come and attend and get their membership. The Greek term translated church in the Greek New Testament is the term ekklesia. Okay, it's this term ecclesia, and it literally means an assembly, a congregation, a gathering. But the English term church comes from an entirely different German word that we've adopted. And this started sometime in 300 AD from the Goths. We, we adopted this German term known as, and I'm gonna see if I get it right, because I had some German-speaking people in first service say, you butchered that pronunciation. I said, I told you I would. It's Kircha. I think I got it right. Kircha is the German word that they translated church. So it went from ecclesia, which was assembly, gathering, congregation, to Kircha, which is of the house, or the Lord's house is what that word means. And so it became more centralized. And so with this bad interpretation that really started to make waves in about 300 AD, with that bad translation came this bad theology. And so the church then became a place where people come, listen, and they're told what to do, and they go and they live. That's what the church became. And so when it came to the Bible, it was whatever the priest tells me, he translates it, we listen, we learn, and we go. That's a problem. But people were taking advantage of that. However, in the early 1500s, God raised up a man known as William Tyndale. William Tyndale's a good looking guy. William Tyndale, we'll call him Willie T. Tyndale was an English author and he was a linguistic scholar, a scholar in the languages. William decided that it was time for the average person, like people like you and I, 
for the average person to be able to have access to the Bible. The only way people could have access to the Bible in that day, as I said, was to come, be a part of a church, and listen to the interpretation from a person who had authority. No one had access to it other than those higher ups, those elites. So in that sense, you could control and manipulate people, and unfortunately, that's what was happening over the generations. So Willie T began to translate from the original Hebrew and Greek text, also there's some Aramaic spun in there as well, and he began to translate it into English. And the church leaders were furious about it because then it was calling out their control and their control then was going to be limited. And they were furious. So essentially, Willie T became a fugitive in his homeland and he had to flee. Church politics at its worst. Tyndale had a vision to make sure that the average person, like you and I, could have access to the word of God that men and women could sit before it and study it and read it themselves and be in the presence of God with the word of God sitting on their laps. He wanted to make sure the movement wouldn't simply keep us in house and tethered to the house. But as a spirit filled child of God, that we would be a house that comes alive and is open for others to come in and for people who live in the house to go out and to be the family of God that we were created to be. It was Tyndale's hope and his mission. So with that in mind, let's go back to Acts 1, some 1,400 plus years before Tyndale was born. And let's read Acts 1, 6 through 11 again. Look at this. This is right prior to the ascension. Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, and the word of God tells us he appeared for 40 days. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people that he met with, that Paul speaks of. Then he gathered around him, Luke writes, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Essentially, they're like, man, this last 40 days has been cool. We've been in locked rooms and you all of a sudden appeared. It was like crazy, Lord, but what's your next move now? What's the next move here? You gonna restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, Jesus, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They're thinking, yeah, we could do that. And in all Judea, okay. In Samaria, ah, we don't really like those people, but uh. And to the ends of the earth. Okay, this is a huge mission. After he said this, verse nine, he was taken up before their very eye and a cloud hid him from their sight. Verse 10, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These are angels. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? Kind of a silly question to ask. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Here's the thing about our house. This is a series we've been in starting last week. We'll close it next week. I know it's been said that the church is meant to be a hospital. I, I like that analogy personally. I probably used it myself a couple times. And I think there's a lot of good comparisons that could be used for that. The church being like a hospital. But our house is not simply meant to be a hospital when you think about it. At a hospital, you bring people in, and all the work is usually done in-house. We have all the equipment in-house, the ventilators, the rehab machine. We have rehab in-house, all of that. The doctors are in-house. The paramedics come to get you, and they bring you to the house, the hospital. Because when you're in a house, when you're in a hospital, you're safe. The thought. But what happened here in Acts 1 that we just read seems to me, as Jesus ascends to heaven, more like a group of 
soldiers being called to action, more like a team of people being called to action. To not forsake the gathering, yes. To meet regularly, sure, of course. But to not allow the gathering to be a hindrance to the movement. But rather, the gathering is to be a blessing to the movement. The gathering should help to propel the movement. The gathering should help to move the movement. And I don't know about you, but when I first came to Jesus at the age of 17 years old, it felt to me, I got all fired up. I was just in my room alone. I felt like the Lord come on me in this amazing way and just come upon me. And, and I fell on my knees in repentance with tears in my eyes all alone in my room in that small mobile home in Bourbon, a, Illinois. And I thought to myself, this life is gonna be crazy. Woo, I am excited. Then I hurry up and I get involved in a church and I'm like, man, this is gonna be awesome. And then I'm like, stand up, sit down, sit down, do this program, huh, duh, duh. And I'm like, really? I gotta read this thing. I just didn't feel like the same God that impacted my heart and what I'm experiencing right now doesn't seem like there's a connect. There wasn't anything wrong with the church that I was a part of. I ended up some many years later being a pastor on one of the campuses there. But what I realized is all too often the church can easily become a hindrance to the movement and not a blessing to it. And I'm not suggesting that's what we're doing here or anything like that. Some of y'all are like, honey, start the car. Uh, uh, no. But I really do believe sometimes as church folk, many of us here, church folk, a lot of us are de church, which means at one time we were part of a church, now we're just coming back into the church and we're like, what is it with this thing that I had church hurt and church pain many years back? A lot of us are in that boat here. I know, I know your stories. So, how can we as a church better model? what the early church looked like, while also some of these new implementations that we have here in the West that has seemingly helped to work and bring disciples and make more and better disciples. How can we merge those without becoming a hindrance to the movement? I'm gonna give some important factors in this movement that began 2,000 years ago, and as a result of it, we're all here today because of it. And the first is the truth of the message gripped their hearts in mind. So, so if these things remain true in us today, I think there is no way that we could possibly be a hindrance to the movement, but only a blessing to the movement. And here's what happened then, and I pray it's happening today in our hearts and our minds. The message, the truth of the message, gripped their hearts and minds in a supernatural way. I enjoy telling stories. I was reading a book to see on a Friday night about a koala named Kevin. It's a make-believe story about a koala named Kevin who wouldn't come down from his tree and hang out with his other animal friends because he was comfortable in his surroundings and he was fearful of any new surroundings. It's a great story with great lessons in life. You should check it out. But, but the reality is <laughs> that it is a made-up story that doesn't grip your heart the next day. Let me give you an for example, for example, our daughter Sienna isn't so gripped when I read this story to her the next day that she wakes up and says, I need to tell all of my friends about the message of the koala named Kevin and how he came down from that tree. I am looking forward to giving my life to the message of Kevin the koala. She doesn't say that. If she did, we would be in counseling. But the power, listen to me, in the message of Jesus Christ is, it actually happened and it has authority. And it's caused you to be here today. You see the difference? 
The event of the crucifixion took place. The resurrection is a historical event to Christians all over the world. This is not Kevin the Koala from some undisclosed location. This is Jesus of Nazareth that we're talking about. And Luke here, the author of Acts, is now writing his second historical account. Luke is a physician who is highly esteemed in the first century. And he's writing this historical account to the great Theophilus, who is most likely a high-level Roman dignitary. And he's given him the lowdown on all that he has historically dove into, and he met eyewitnesses and people who have accounts, and he's writing this second account. The first account is the Gospel of Luke. The second account is what we know as Acts. And it's quite possible that this Theophilus is the same one that Paul talks about in Philippians 4 when he speaks of someone in a high level from the household of Caesar who came to faith. And so the physician Luke is giving an orderly account of events that have taken place. This is what's happening in Acts. This isn't Kevin the Koala stuff. And after Jesus ascends and a couple angels show up on the scene, this group that was about 120 people, Luke reports, go back into Jerusalem and they don't know, they just pray. They're supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. I assume they woke up the next day like, has it happened yet? I feel the same, nothing changed. And and they just wait and pray. And about two weeks later, the power that Jesus was referring to that would come upon them happened to come upon them at a historic Jewish festival known as Pentecost. And it happened. It actually happened. There were people groups from all over the known world at this time who flooded to Jerusalem. And the Spirit of God came upon them like a violent wind, the word describes. And people started speaking in other languages the message of the gospel. So so you have one person from Ethiopia and you have one person not from Ethiopia all of a sudden speaking without even knowing it their language, in the truth of Jesus, in their language. This happened. Over a dozen people groups were together in Jerusalem at this time, according to Luke. And people are floored, and they're also probably a bit freaked out, because you don't plan on that happening when you wake up that day, okay? And what happens is, Peter, the same guy who was a coward, a lot like me probably if he's a coward, a coward like me, I'll throw myself out there, stands up filled with the Holy Spirit and he begins to deliver a message and the Bible says at the end of that message the people who were there were cut deep in the heart. And they say the words that I I know any preacher with a spine would wanna hear people say after they preach a message. Here's the words they say that's found in Acts chapter two, verse 37 on the back half of it. After a message, it come on, and people just stood up and said, all right, we heard the message, now what shall we do? That's like, yes, they get it, they got it. These are people who heard the message of the gospel, that Jesus was the fulfillment of the scriptures that they hung and clung so tightly to, and now miraculously, the same ones who were yelling, crucify him two months ago, are now saying, I imagine with tears in their eyes and conviction in their hearts, oh my goodness, what have we done? We were a part of this massacre. Now what shall we do? Peter, Disciples of his, who we thought you guys were just nuts. Well, what do we do now? And here's what Peter says in the following verse. First thing, Peter replied, repent. Repent. Check and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and check every room in your heart. Have you guys ever experienced, this repentance is, repentance is crazy. I don't know if you experienced it. I pray you're experiencing it. 
Repentance is wild because the Holy Spirit will come in and check every room of your heart and just wreak havoc. It's awesome, but it's wild. I remember when I f- first believed in repentance and, and I just, I just the, the Spirit just came on me and I was just like, I'm living like an idiot. I am a, I am a wretched person. I am a person that needs serious help. And the Holy Spirit just reveals that all to you. And he goes into every room of your heart, every lustful room, every prideful room, every room that is just against the will and the message of God. And he goes in there and he wreaks havoc. And that's the first thing that Peter says to do when it's like, what what do we do now? We believe in the message, we're cut deep. The Spirit has obviously moved in our hearts. What's going on? We don't even know what spirit is. We need to figure all this stuff out. And Peter says, repent and be baptized. The new sign of the covenant for all people, Jews and Gentiles. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, that's everyone. Everyone who's a far off, which is all of us. This is how the message came to us. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, because if you're a preacher, you often have many other words. And he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added. 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3K, believing and baptized. And Dory, you had about nine in Lake Michigan, right? The, the, imagine 3K, 3,000. It would have taken days, possibly weeks. My question to you is, has the truth of this message also gripped your heart and mind? church, assembly, gathering, family? Has the truth of this message gripped your heart and your mind? This was a movement that moved people. You you couldn't hear this message and just be like, all right, see you next week. Doing fantasy football, we'll do that. Okay, yeah, I'm not against that. I'm in three leagues, okay? I'm not against that, but I'm just saying, like this wasn't a message that you heard and you're like, Huh. All right, now let's go about our normal business. You know, that's my, that's me with the plow. I don't know. But that, that's, <laughs> this was something that was radically going to grip your heart and mind and not let go and not allow you to be the same. Do you get it? It moved people out of their comfort zones. It moved people to serve. It moved people to live outside of themselves. Movements move people. Let me just be real with you. Uh, When it comes to healthy rhythms, because this is the season, this is the time where we're all trying to change our rhythms, and it's great. But when it comes to healthy rhythms, if you feel like the enemy is really holding you back from even getting to church on Sunday, from getting to your small group, from spending time with God alone, or maybe he's holding you back from serving in areas that you know you're called to serve, you have gifts, and we'll talk a little bit more about that Next week, let me ask this. Could it be that we are minimizing the work and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, both individually and corporately? If we constantly feel held back and restrained, could we, just an idea, be minimizing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our lives as a church together? I I think it's a fair question. I want to invite us in 2022 to be a people that are moved by the movement of the Holy Spirit. Here's what happened the very next verse after 3,000 came to Jesus and came to faith in Jesus from an obscure land. They were baptized, filled with the Spirit. Acts 2.42, this is the very next verse. What did they do next? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so to teaching the Word of God, They didn't have it sitting in front of them like all we have. They didn't have YouTube, you can look up messages, all that, they didn't have none of that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You wanna know more 
about this call of God into fellowship, to gathering, to the breaking of bread, which is most likely communion, and to prayer. That's what they did. They devoted themselves to those things. They humbled themselves, in short, to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They humbled themselves to the leading and to the authority of God. Surrendered. When you humble yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit, your life will radically change, friends. There's no other option. Your schedules will change, your priorities will change, what you are devoted to will change. You'll grow to realize, I have spiritual gifts that God has given me. One of the craziest things and the things that break my heart, and I know it comes from a place of brokenness when people say this, but it's just like, I have nothing to offer people. I have nothing to offer God, and it breaks my heart because I know that comes from a deep place of brokenness, often depression and hurt, and people speaking lies to them. But it's a lie. Every one of us have spiritual gifts. Every believer in here has gifts to offer others and to help advance the movement from gifts of administration to preaching, from exhortation, being an encourager, many of you are that, and giving, like every gift of the Spirit is meant to propel the movement of Jesus Christ forward. Every gift. What is it that happens when truth grips a group of people's hearts and minds and they humble themselves to the leading of the Spirit? In conclusion, I believe amazing things happen. I believe powerful things happen. I believe big things happen. We often see many coming to faith in Jesus when a group of people are gripped by the truth of God in their hearts and minds and they're moved with conviction and they humble themselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Crazy big things happen, church. This is why small groups here are being encouraged to multiply and to not stay comfortable with your own little flock of eight, 10, 12 of y'all. We're called to multiply. This is why ministries are being added here. Not so that simply the church can be bigger, but so that the church's impact can be bigger in the community that we live in. And the church is being called upon to step up. And we'll talk a lot more about that next week. Peter preaches at Pentecost. 3,000 are added. Two weeks later, he preaches again. Acts says, Luke accounts. Another 5,000 are added. The movement's wild. It's unbelievable. God does big things when small people like you and I are gripped by the truth and humble ourselves to the leading of the Spirit. He does big things with small people. If you feel like you've been on the outside looking in, maybe all 2021, you just feel like you've been in a spiritual lull. And it's, man, let me tell you, I can, I can relate with that. It would be easy in 2021 or 2020 at that to really feel like you're in a spiritual lull because of just our culture and just what has happened and taken place in our day and age. It's been a wild season, man. People are at war with each other, usually on the boards or on Facebook and social media. It's like people just seem to like, be angry. And so if you feel like you've fallen into that, you've just come into this spiritual lull where you've heard other voices above the voice that you really should be listening to, you're not alone. Let's get that thing corrected. Let's start new. Let's start fresh. We want to get you connected here to a small group. Maybe you're like, this church isn't for me. Great. I, I, meet with me. I'll give you a list of another 20 churches in about a 20-mile radius that are awesome churches, would love to. But if you wanna get connected here, we love you to get connected here. Check out coopersvillereform.com, fill out a connect card, we'll get you connected. If you feel like you're simply not contributing, you wanna serve, but you just don't know if there's a place for you to serve, come back next week. We're gonna have ways that you can serve. Maybe most importantly, if you need prayer, if you need prayer, you need someone to pray for you. Meet with me, we have other elders here. Meet with someone and just say, before you leave this church, I just need prayer. Will you pray for me? 
There's nothing more that I would like to do after service than just pray, pray for you. And there are others here as well who will be up here that they would love to pray for you. On that note, would you pray with me? God, I, I long to see your church be what you have called it and created it to be. I, I wanna be a better part of that. I wanna be more conformed to, to your idea of what that looks like. And, and God, I, I just pray as, as we go from here that these words wouldn't go in one ear and out the other, that this wouldn't just be a, a sermon that, that comes and goes and we move on to the next week, but that we would be more of a people that would conform to your ways and to your idea of what you're calling us to be here in Coopersville and beyond. Help us, Father, to live outside of ourselves. That's another huge characteristic of the people of God when the Spirit of God enters them. They just live outside of themselves. They live selflessly. Help us to be that type of people, God. Help us to be people who don't hold on to old ideologies and old myths and wives' tales, Kevin the Koala type stuff, and help us to hold on to your word and to hold fast to what is true. Father, we love you. We're grateful for the work that you're doing in this church. And we're excited and we're anticipating you to do much greater things for your name. We love you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray.